Amen. What a great job, choir. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that here this morning. Well, this morning we are, as far as the message today goes, back in the book of Mark as we continue our our journey through this uh, great gospel. And I would ask you this morning to turn to a parallel passage uh, that is um, in Matthew chapter 15. It's parallel to the passage of Scripture uh, that we'll be looking at in Mark chapter 7 this morning. But Matthew chapter 15, and I'd like to begin reading for us in verse 21. And so if you would please stand this morning as uh, we honor the Lord as we read his word this morning. Verse 21, Matthew 15, Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, it is, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And then Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. Father, we come to this amazing passage of Scripture. And Lord, our hearts are desiring to understand it as you have intended for us to understand it. Help our minds and hearts to be open, and may the Spirit of God illuminate this precious passage so that we can glean from it, Lord, the truth that you desire to speak to our hearts with this morning. Help us, Father, to comprehend the true scope of what we're reading today. And may you be glorified in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. We find out from this passage of Scripture that Jesus, uh, after addressing the Pharisees and uh, understanding that whole issue with hand washing before you eat bread and all of the things that Jesus was trying to teach them had uh, certainly not enhanced the relationship, shall I say. Uh, The relationship has been more and more strained with the Pharisees and and when you see Pharisees and Sadducees in the same group coming to uh, challenge you, you know you're in a world of trouble and uh, Jesus was certainly in that world. And it comes to the point where uh, at times Jesus is just looking for a respite a time when he can pull away and he can come to the disciples and to be able to teach the disciples in a, in a, in a plain and fashion that uh, they were not normally dealing with. And so this is the scenario that we uh, encounter here in verse 21. Now I'm noticing here in this passage the area to which they're going. And the area is one that um, we're maybe not as familiar with. Jesus actually goes from the Sea of Galilee and Capernaum being on the northern edge of the Sea of Galilee. He travels northwest to the Mediterranean coast. And it's there he encounters these two cities. And the first place he's going to go is to the city of Tyre. And he's going to go there and eventually go on up to Sidon before he ends up going on a southerly route, which will put him in an area known as the Decapolis, which is on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus is taking his disciples, and he is seeking to perhaps get away. Uh, But as you read it and as you begin to understand it, it's more about his teaching and his time of discipleship with these with these 12 disciples. Jesus goes to an area uh, that we're going to talk a little bit more about, but we're going to encounter uh, through these next couple of weeks various reactions to faith. And I would submit to you this morning that the first uh, group of people that we're going to encounter are the feeble, the faith of the feeble. We're also going to talk about the faith of the Pharisees 
And we're going to talk about the faith of the, of the afflicted. They're all Fs, right? Pharaoh, Pharisees, that's an F. Afflicted, that's an F, right? <laughs> it's a stretch, I know, but, you know, bear with me, right? It's really hard to come up with these things, you know? So it's kind of like, eh, bend the rules whenever you can. You're not hurting anything, and maybe people will remember because it's crazy. As, as you look at this passage, we're going to encounter again, various reactions to the gospel, various reactions to Jesus, and we're going to experience what the different levels of faith look like, or in the case of the Pharisees, we're going to look at the faithless Pharisees. As things go on, there is a progression here that is going to be noteworthy, and I'll tie it all together next Sunday. So if you can't be here next Sunday, try to buy the tape, right? Uh, that's what they used to say. Uh, but this morning, we're going to deal with the faith of the feeble. Take your Bibles, go back with me over to Mark chapter 7, and picking this up in verse 24, Jesus got up and he went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it. Jesus desires to just uh, obviously have some time uh, to himself or time with just the disciples. And he comes to this place of Tyre. Tyre was a city, and these are off the, the beaten paths because this is a Gentile area. But nonetheless, we read in Mark chapter 3 that when some of the healing was going on on the Sabbath, there was a large crowd the Bible describes. And it says they came from Judea and they came from Idumea, and they even list Tyre and Sidon. And they say that there were people from Tyre and Sidon early on in Jesus' ministry that are witnessing what Jesus was doing. Key point here is to understand Jesus was drawing an enormous audience from enormous areas. People uh, were not just impacted in the area of Capernaum where Jesus was making it a, kind of a teaching hub. It wasn't just Jerusalem that had heard about Jesus. People are coming from far and wide because they want to experience the teaching of Jesus because no one's ever taught like Jesus has taught. And certainly no one's ever done these types of miracles that we see Jesus doing. So people uh, are, are coming, and the Bible says that he wanted no one to know about it, and yet he couldn't escape notice. After hearing of him, there was a woman, and she's going to be the, the focus of our text here this morning. We would understand that this uh, Syrophoenician woman, as she's called, is the feeble one. She's the one that we're introduced to. She's the one that is going to have a whole bunch of hurdles. Now, what is going on here exactly is described in verse 25. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now, it's hard to imagine that a child could be demon-possessed. But that's exactly the case here. Can you imagine as a parent how you would feel if that was your child? Now understand that in areas where the gospel has not penetrated, you see the darkness, the spiritual darkness with great strength. We here in the United States have been really blessed because of the predominance of the gospel. Even when you go back 100 years, when people were learning how to read, they were oftentimes uh, learning by reading the scriptures. I was in a historical building uh, recently, and I was reading about this one-room schoolhouse and what the standards were for the teachers. It was pretty neat. If they had free time, they could read the Bible. I like that, okay? And that was only 100 years ago, which seems like a lot if you're only 10. But when you're 60, 100 years doesn't really seem like that much, right? <laughs> I mean, as things change. But understand that in our country, we're seeing an erosion because there's always that ebb and flow, but we're seeing an erosion of our spiritual values in our country, and it is opening the door to more and more satanic activity. When you come to Sidon and Tyre, I'm going to be talking about them in a moment, these were places where there was not the emphasis on the scriptures, and they were very, very wicked areas. In fact, the religions of the time that were embedded there were very, very pagan. Wherever you have that type of pagan, idolatrous type of worship, you have the ebb and flow going back and forth where Satan gets a stronger 
uphold in the society. And one of the manifestations of that is through this demonic activity, whether people are being oppressed or absolutely possessed, as is the case with the Syrophoenician woman. So we're seeing, I believe, more of this in our own culture today. As we uh, step away from the scriptures and as we uh, refuse to be governed by God's word as a society, we see more and more of Satan's activity to the extent that we see so many horrible things happening in our society among people and we sit there and we shake our heads, wonder how in the world this could be. But so much of this is truly demonic activity, I believe. And you could go into other countries, and people you've traveled, you've done missions trips, you know what it's like when you go into a different culture where you don't have the hand of God in a very profound way of being lived out among the people. You begin to see just how strategic Satan truly is and working in the minds and hearts of people. This is what we're being introduced to in this text with this woman who has a child nonetheless who has a demon inside her. She has an unclean spirit as the scriptures term it. And my heart breaks for this woman. I don't know about you, but I just look at it and I just can imagine what she is going through. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, how horrible could that be? This woman is interesting because there's a lot of hurdles that she has in order to be able to even gain an audience with Jesus. Uh, as we would understand it, uh, the first thing she's dealing with is the fact that she's a woman. Uh, in this culture, that was a difficult place to be heard. If you were a woman and you wanted an audience with a master teacher like Jesus, it would almost be uh, so difficult that you would be like the woman who had the affliction, who just wanted to touch the tassel of Jesus' garment, uh, because you knew that you couldn't get front and center with someone like this. In fact, no rabbi would be willing to sit down and talk with you, because not only are you a woman, but you're also a Gentile woman. And that's a huge, huge problem. What we find out about this woman is she's not only those things, but she's also from this area, Syrophoenicia. And it was Phoenicia that had been annexed to the Roman Empire through a Roman gen general some time before. Matthew actually states that she was a descendant of the Canaanites. Do you remember anything about the Canaanites? I mean, good people up, to, you know, I mean, would you, <laughs> it, you remember Joshua, when we were going through Joshua, the Canaanites were the enemy in the land. That's who God said, I want you to drive out of, the, of Israel. You had to go in there and drive these people out. And we understood that the embedded wickedness within the Canaanites was steep, wasn't it? I mean, uh, all the horrible things that they did with child sacrifices and, and the sin, the deplorable nature of that, uh, it justified, uh, certainly in the eyes of a holy God, their extermination. And it was a huge deal. So for the people of Israel, maybe, you know, if you were getting together with the rabbis and you said, well, yeah, I'm a Canaanite, that didn't get you many points. Do you know what I mean? So here's this woman who's a Gentile, who's not only that, but she's from this area of Phoenicia, and she happens to be a descendant of the Canaanites. And one of the things that you're also going to understand is this woman is in all likelihood an idol worshiper. You say, well, Pastor Kevin, why do you say that? Pagan worship in this area was pinging at the 910 level. Everybody was a pagan worshiper. And they worshiped these false gods. Among them was the goddess Astrid or Astaroth, if you think of your Old Testament. And so embedded in this culture is idol worship. This woman was an idol worshiper. And here she is, she's coming to Jesus. And what well-respected rabbi during the time period would even allow themselves to be in the presence of such a person. You see, this woman was truly feeble, and it was going to be very, very difficult for her to gain an audience with Jesus, let alone to be able to dialogue with Jesus. As I look at this passage of Scripture, I'm frankly blown away by it. I'm blown away by it. I've been excited about this passage of Scripture all week long. I mean like really revved up about it. 
I, I, I'm so excited about it, and it just doesn't get old. I'm just, I'm just thrilled with this passage of Scripture. And if you walk out of here like a quarter of uh, with my thrilledness, I'll be happy uh, if I can convey it at all to you. I mean, I think that, that there is something here that is absolutely amazing and exciting. And here it is. I No more delay, right? As you look at this, Jesus hears this woman and the Bible says that she came, this Syrophoenician Gentile, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Now the word there is that present participle. She kept asking and asking and asking and asking and asking. She was never going to take no for an answer. She came, she didn't care that she was a woman, she didn't care that she was a Gentile, she didn't care if he knew all of the false idols that she had in her home. She was coming because she was seeking to be delivered. In Matthew chapter 15, it says that she kept asking and asking and asking, and Jesus was silent. And it drove the disciples crazy. Jesus, Jesus, you must heal my daughter. Jesus, Jesus, you must heal my daughter. And, and Jesus just acts like he doesn't hear this woman. And it's going on. Jesus, 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 would you help me? Jesus, my daughter, Jesus, Jesus. And finally, the disciples are like, will you simply put this woman away? I don't know about you, but I don't really have that big of a tolerance for such a scenario. I was just driving myself crazy in the last 10 seconds. <laughs> What are you going to do, Jesus, with this woman? Will, can we just get rid of her? If I was one of the 12 disciples and I asked that and Jesus said, okay, I'd volunteer for the job. I would escort her out. She is driving us all crazy. She is driving us to the point where we want to be rid of the noise. We want to be rid of that loud, impassioned plea that this woman is bringing. Can we just get a little bit of quiet here? Jesus says to this woman, let the children be satisfied first, for it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And what he was speaking about here was that the relationship that he had with the people of Israel was supremely his motivation in coming to the world. And she answers him and says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. Now, this lady, the problem for the feeble is that we all are sinful, the solution for the feeble is faith. And we see in this discourse that she is keeping on asking him. She's urgent. There's an urgency there. She realizes that among all of her pagan gods, there was not one of those false gods who did anything for her daughter. Do you see that? There's, not, not, there's nothing the world can offer. Her only hope is Jesus. And she's beginning to understand that that is the case. And so everything else is gone. And she is truly focused on her only solution, which is Jesus. She is coming to Jesus with an urgency. She is coming with a humility. Matthew 15, 22, she says, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly tormented by a demon. And so there's that urgency, there's the humility, and lastly, we see her persistence in Matthew 15, 23. Jesus doesn't answer her. And as, as one who wouldn't be answered, you would think that she would just simply give up and go home. I guess there's nothing for me here. I guess there's, there's no answers, there's no help. And so she would normally, you would think, just kind of walk away. But she doesn't walk away. She stays there, and she finally hears Jesus speak. And when Jesus speaks to her, 
he is demonstrating the fact that he was Messiah and is Messiah come to the house of Israel. Interesting. She makes the statement after Jesus says that the children shouldn't have their food given to the dogs. Now, I'm all for that. I don't believe in feeding dogs at the table. Now, that's just the way it is in my world. Um, but I don't have a dog, so I don't worry about it. <laughs> the, there's two words in the original language for dogs. One was the, the kind of dog that roamed in a pack in the street. They were kind of ornery things. You know those dogs. They eat them in some places. Not around here, but they do eat them in some places. And then there's these other dogs that are little lap dogs, cute dogs, you know, nice doggy, and you could eat while you were even holding one, I guess. And this is the word Jesus uses for the dog, the little lap dog, the little pet. So his, his words are gentle to a degree. But she picks up on this, and it is so amazing that she picks up on it because she says to him, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. That is true, isn't it? Even those little, little nuggets that fall off of the table end up being gobbled up by the dog. And the, that's fair game for a dog, right? I mean, we would all agree with that. You drop it on the floor, there's that five-second rule thing where if you pick it up, it's, it's okay to eat again. I, I can extend that out 15 seconds. I mean, I really can, it's depending on what it is. I mean, it's fine with me. Um, but if a dog beats me to it, it's fair game. I mean, everybody's got to be on their wheels, and you've got to make it happen. Uh, this is a, a picture of someone I know, and uh, he tends to be a fairly loose eater, shall I say. Uh, there's always more than enough. There's a banquet on the floor after he's done. And you see how easy it would be for him to um, not care about those crumbs that would fall down. But here as I'm looking at this passage, I'm looking at the response of Jesus. And he says, because of this answer, that even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs, Go, he says, the demon has gone out of your daughter. Now, here's the amazing thing, and this is what has me so stoked this week. I'm looking at a person in this woman who is absolutely not even to be in the presence of someone like Jesus. And when Jesus doesn't answer her, she should have just walked away. Oh, but she doesn't. Because she realized that her only hope in this world was in the person of Jesus. Now think of this this way. Jesus is 100% God. And 100%, somebody said Jewish, yes. <laughs> we won't get into that. If you ever checked his DNA, it would be really pretty amazing, I think. He's 100% divine, and he's also 100% human. And we sometimes, we, 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 we mix those, we understand that uh, to a degree as far as our brain can understand it. But can I just point out the fact that Jesus is God, no question? That what we have in front of us is the demonstration of God and the willingness of God to talk to a feeble woman who was an idol worshiper who had a need and was willing to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord and the Son of David. That she is not cast out, but instead there is a dialogue going on between herself and God. I am amazed at this dialogue. I am encouraged by this dialogue because as, as feeble as this woman is, every single one of us is here is feeble, amen? There's none righteous. There is no one here that is not in need of the Savior, Jesus the Christ. And your situation is no doubt different than this woman's situation was, but your need is just as great. The urgency of your heart and soul should be as, as urgent as she was. And when you sit back and you recognize your spiritual condition, there is no way that you will be stopped short of having a dialogue with God. And God who is holy is also rich in grace and mercy. 
He is willing to have this discussion with a sinner like me so that I could pray and place my faith in Jesus and he wouldn't cast me out. This is our amazing God, is it not? I am blown away by her, her willingness. I'm blown away by the fact that she, frankly, is able to understand and perceive that he is the Messiah. I'm blown away by that, that she could understand that because as we go through this whole progression, we're going to see that the disciples don't have this grasp at times. But there she is, willing to acknowledge that he is the son of David. And I'm blown away by the fact that she could make that statement after Jesus said, I'm here first to minister to the Jewish people. Now there's some passages of scripture I just want to read for, read from so that uh, it might give us a, a sense of of the relationship that God has with his people and how things changed as his people uh, rejected him. I'm over in Romans chapter 9, and you might want to just jot down a few of these passages and read them later. But in Romans chapter 9 and verse 30, it says, What should we say then? Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained righteousness. Ooh, that's interesting. The Gentiles who weren't even pursuing this righteousness, but they've obtained it. Namely, the righteousness that comes from faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of, for righteousness, has not achieved the righteousness of the law. Why is that? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. The Jewish people looked at the law, a law that they were unable to keep. It was impossible for the Jewish people because they were imperfect and are imperfect to ever be able to fulfill the law. The law was not fulfilled until Jesus Christ came and he lived the perfect life and fulfilled the law of righteousness but, and showed, showed the Jewish people that it was doable but you would have to be perfect, hence you are not able to do it. And so you needed to come to Jesus and put your faith in him in order to be able to be made righteous. Same book of scripture, it says that Abraham was made righteous by his faith in God. You see, faith is always that quotient. The people of Israel rejected the idea of faith and they hunkered down trying to become righteous by obeying the law. When they failed at obeying the law, remember Jesus just last Sunday we were talking about this, it is the heart, it's what comes out of a man who defies a man because it was viewed that the law was too difficult to keep they decided that what they would do is they'd make all kinds of other regulations that they could keep but they were still unrighteous notice over in Romans chapter 10 it tells us there that in the Old Testament God says in verse 19 but I asked, did Israel not understand? First Moses said, I'll make you jealous of those who are not a nation. I'll make you angry by a nation that lacks understanding. Isaiah said boldly, I was found by those who were not looking for me. I revealed myself to those who were not asking for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long, I have spread out my hands to a disobedient and defiant people. You see, God was going to use the Gentile people all along. It was always part of God's plan. This wasn't an accident for Jesus to go up into Tyre and Sidon. Are you with me? It, this wasn't an accident. Jesus knew that they were going to know exactly where he was. Jesus knew that this woman was going to find him. And when she found him, she was going to discuss this with him. And Jesus would turn to her and say, Woman, how great is your faith. Chapter 11 of Romans uh, says there in Verse uh, 11, it says, I asked then, have they stumbled in order to fall? Absolutely not. On the contrary, by their stumbling, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. Now, if their stumbling brings riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full number bring? I'm speaking to you, he says, to the Gentiles in view of the fact that I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry if I can somehow make my own people jealous and save some of them. God has a heart, doesn't he? Not only for the Jewish people whom Jesus came to seek and to save, but Jesus also has a heart 
for the Gentiles like you and me. You and I share in the feebleness of this woman. There's not one of us who's righteous. All of us are probably Gentiles with a few exceptions perhaps. We find ourselves steeped in unrighteousness or false religion. And yet when we came to Jesus, he forgave us of our sins. He was faithful. And we're so thankful for that. What Jesus does next is uh, fairly interesting as well. Notice with me in Mark chapter 8 and verse 1. In those days when there was again a large crowd, they had nothing to eat. Jesus called his disciples and said to them, I feel compassion for the people. Where did Jesus go exactly? Remember this slide from uh, earlier on? After Jesus goes to Tyre, he goes up to Sidon briefly, and then he goes back down to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And there he begins to minister in an area known as the Decapolis. Decapolis denotes 10 Gentile cities that were predominant in that area. Now, where have we heard of the Decapolis before? Well, we heard about it when we were reading through Mark and we came to the, six, the section dealing with the Gadarean. Do you remember the the Gadarean who was demon-possessed with thousands of demons in him. He came running down the, the mountainside, and Jesus was stepping out of the boat, and Jesus encountered him and, and sent the demons flying, and they went off into a herd of swine. You remember that? And they all, yeah, it was, it was fascinating. He was from Decapolis, and he went back to Decapolis to praise the name of God and tell the people there what he'd done. So when Jesus comes from Sidon on down to the Decapolis, there are thousands of people who want to hear him. In fact, there are 4,000 men, and if you add the women and the children, there were probably over 10,000 people in this Gentile hotbed who were listening to what Jesus had to say. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? In the midst of all the ministry of Jesus, coming to the Jewish people, he has time to come to the Gentile people as well. And there are Gentiles who are placing their faith in him. Now, what they recognize is the same thing that the woman recognized. That in her own power and strength, she had nothing to offer. She couldn't deal with the problems that she had. She needed the Savior. She needed Jesus. And there are some things for us to stop and think about. One is God's willingness to dialogue with sinners like us should really grab our attention. God is not a God who's off in the, in the heavens someplace doing his own thing with no care or concern for you and I. He cares greatly about us, amen? He wants to discuss things with you. If you're here today and you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, open your heart, open your mind to Jesus. Let God's word speak to your heart. Let him answer the questions that you have on your heart. The Holy Spirit's role in your life would be very significant. Stop and think about the impact that God has in your life, even if you're a follower of Christ. And be thankful that God was willing to dialogue with a sinner like this woman, and he's willing to dialogue with a sinner like us. The next point we need to stop and consider is Jesus' ability to deliver us from our sin and give us new life in him it, it, the world doesn't have any answers. And because of the power of the cross, we should be motivated to share the good news. It should really motivate us when we stop and we think about the, the, the fact that there's a whole world out there that doesn't have answers. There's a whole world that's wondering about life. There's a whole world that's struggling. And it's not an easy situation at all for them. We should be motivated to share our faith. Last but not least, the lack of faith in some should not discourage us, but we should continue to sow the seeds of the gospel, knowing that God is at work and that some will eventually come to genuine faith. As a matter of contrast, we'll talk about those faithless Pharisees. We'll talk about the afflicted. We'll look at the, the lack of faith in many, and we'll stop and we'll consider the impact that these have. 
there would be the Pharisees who would listen to Jesus' teaching when they had the opportunity. They listened with a critical mind and a critical spirit, and yet they heard. And yet many of them, most of them, would never come to faith in Jesus. There would be someone who is very unlikely in a place called Tyre who would hear the gospel and respond and put their faith in Jesus. We live in the same type of world, don't we? We, we live in the same type of world as a Tyre where there's pagan worship all around us. We live in the same type of environment where most people aren't interested, but some are. There are people like the Syrophoenician women who live around us. There are people who are desperate, and they don't know where to turn. And we have the responsibility of introducing them to Jesus so that they might be able to have the life change that we've experienced a blessing that we know so, so well. Would you pray with me, please? As we bow our heads before the Lord this morning, let me just encourage you today. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, would you today... Take an honest look at your own heart and ask yourself, do I have a relationship with God? Or am I just trying to do good works? I'm just trying to be successful by living according to the law. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, know that our God is a God who loves you deeply who's willing to have a conversation with you. He will in no wise cast you out. This is our God, a loving God, a patient God, the God who truly cares. He wants you to place your faith in him and know that you have eternal life. That's why he came. You may be here as a follower of Christ already, and I know m most of you are. Would you be motivated to share your faith? So few today are sharing their faith. Maybe we've come to the point where we think that there's no one willing to listen, but that would not be correct. Because just as this woman was desperate and had a desperate need, the world around us is filled with people just like her might be a little different but the story is basically the same there's a need that only jesus christ can meet and i trust that we will not be discouraged by sharing our faith in a marketplace where the world oftentimes doesn't want to hear may we not be discouraged but may we continue on and do god's work sharing the good news with others. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you for the testimony of this woman. Father, we look at a woman who's very, very different than us. Lord, we don't even come across the term Syrophoenician in our world. And yet, Lord, as we look at her life, we realize that there are many similarities. Because we were dead in our trespasses and sins, there was only one way for us to be spiritually made alive, and that was faith in Christ. Lord, help us, Father, to have a passion as our Savior had a passion, to share the love of Christ with a world that desperately needs to hear it. And Father, may you truly work in our hearts today. If there's someone here this morning who's not sure of their eternal destination, Lord, I pray that they would seek uh, out the folks here at the front or talk with someone afterwards. And make certain, Lord, that they're on their way to heaven because of their faith in Christ. Work in our lives, I pray, this coming week and uh, truly, truly accomplish great things through your people here, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. This morning, before you run off, a uh, couple of announcements, but the first announcement that I want to make is it's been great to have Andy and Carol Patton uh, here with us 
uh, this past summer. I'm going to ask them to come up right now. Uh, they are heading back to Peru tomorrow afternoon. It's only like an hour flight, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, they were saying that in the first service that they had some things that they were praying about, and one of them was making sure that their belongings get there, which that's not a given. So anything else we can pray for you about? Oh, uh, well, we were just thankful for so many people that, that uh, helped us while we were here. The Livelies loaned us their car for yeah, nice. almost five months. And Joan Burton let us live with her, and we've had people help us uh, pay for our excess baggage Good. that uh, we're going to have. Am I forgetting anything? No? Just everything. Yeah, just everything. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's been a pleasure to have the patents here with us. I, I just love it. They, they come in and they just dive right in, serving the Lord however they can here. And uh, it's just, uh, it's really been neat uh, to have you guys here this summer. So we appreciate you and appreciate your ministry. On the one hand, it's sad to see them go. But we know that they're serving the Lord, and we know this is still home for you, so you'll be back, and, and we're glad about that, too. Remember to be in prayer for them as they travel. Um, it's always challenging when you go back to a ministry after you've been away for a while. Um, you usually discover things that you didn't anticipate. And also be in prayer for their kids, as um, every time you come, you leave somebody else here. So that, that's, that's tough on the mom or dad. That's, that's really hard. So... Let's stand. We'll have a word of prayer, and uh, I trust that you'll add them to your regular your prayer uh, regimen and, and remember them. Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for the patents, and we thank you, Father, that uh, they've been able to, to be here with us these last few months, and we just would ask, Lord, now that as they, they go back to the field that you've called them to, um, that you would be uh, just with them every step of the way, I pray that simple things, Lord, like in our mind, is just getting the luggage there on time. We pray that that would happen without a hitch. Uh, that, Lord, um, it would be stressless rather than stressful. Mm -hmm. And that you would just richly bless their hand as they serve you there. Uh, may the ministry bear much fruit uh, as they uh, continue to uh, serve you in the various avenues that you've called them to. Uh, Lord, we thank you for their faithfulness. We thank you for the servant's heart that they have demonstrated, even in the months that they've been here with us. They've been in a blessing and encouragement to us, Lord, and we know that we're going to miss them, and we just, again, pray that you would have your hand upon them and encourage them. Uh, encourage them even in spite of, of leaving family members here, Lord. Um, so difficult. But we pray for the kids, and we pray, Lord, that you'd allow them to thrive in their spiritual lives and for them to bear fruit as well. And, Father, uh, continue to work as, as only you can do in each one of their lives. Again, we thank you, and uh, we have much to, to praise you for. We praise you for these servants, Lord, that you've raised up. May you be glorified in through them. And I pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. God bless.